Whether you're organizing your personal data for your own use or organizing project data for work, there are certain procedures you want to follow to make sure your data is easy to find and use. In this video, we'll cover some best organization practices and also check out some different ways project data can be organized. There are plenty of best practices you can use when organizing data, including naming conventions, foldering, and archiving older files. We've talked about file naming before, which is also known as naming conventions. These are consistent guidelines that describe the content, date, or version of a file in its name. Basically, this means you want to use logical and descriptive names for your files to make them easier to find and use. And speaking of easily finding things, organizing your files into folders helps keep project-related files together in one place. This is called foldering. For example, all of the files related to your vacation plan might go in the Vacation 2025 folder. You might then break that folder down even further by creating subfolders like itinerary or photos, depending on what else you'd like to easily access. It can also be useful to move old projects to a separate location to create an archive and cut down on clutter. It's so much easier to find and use my files when I name them something meaningful and searchable, and when I organize them into folders. It makes all my data more accessible and useful. In addition to these three best practices, there are two more things you'll want to consider when organizing data for work use. First, the project data you'll be using for work could be accessed and used by multiple people. So it's important to align your naming and storage practices with your team to avoid any confusion. Your team might also develop metadata practices like creating a file that outlines project naming conventions for easy reference. We'll get to talk more about naming conventions for work files in more detail later. Secondly, you want to think about how often you're making copies of data and storing it in different places. Most importantly because, if data is stored in lots of different databases or spreadsheets, it can contradict itself and lead to mistakes later on. Also, storing data in multiple places takes up a lot of space. Relational databases can help you avoid data duplication and store your data more efficiently. You can use these practices to organize data in different ways according to your project. So let's look at some examples of data organization. I have some sample project folders here, each organized in a slightly different way. Let's open them up and see what they look like. We'll start with the high level finances folder. The finances folder has been organized categorically. There are subfolders like budget, invoices, and payroll that represent different categories. Let's click on invoices to see what's in there. So in the invoices folder, you can see that we have another set of subfolders labeled by year. 2014, 2015. Yep, looks like these are in chronological order. Sometimes the way files are organized can tell us how the data within those files is also organized. Let's open a file to see if that's right. So in the 2014 subfolder, there's a file with invoices from June. If we open it, we can see that they've been organized by date, just like the folders. There's different ways to organize data depending on what you need it for. The categorical organization of the subfolders and finances made it easy for me to go straight to the invoices. But the chronological organization of the invoices subfolder can help us find financial data from the exact date we're looking for. There's other ways to organize data too, in order of importance or even by location. For example, a company might use hierarchical organization so that employee data mirrors the structure of their employee organization or a company working with geographical data might choose to organize by location. It's a good idea to take time early on in a project to consider what the best organization methods will be for you and your team to stick to. Here's another way to think about it. Unorganized data is like a messy room. It's overwhelming, hard to find anything in, and gets worse the longer you avoid cleaning it up. But by making sure early on you know where to put your files, you can keep your work data organized, easy to use, and error-free. Now that you see how important it is to keep data organized for both personal and work use, we'll take a closer look at file naming conventions and how they carry over into your databases. So you've heard me mention the idea of using meaningful and logical file names to help organize your data. But using consistent file names can also streamline or even automate your analysis process, saving you time and energy in the long run. When used consistent guidelines that describe the content, date, 
or version of a file in its name, you're using file naming conventions. And as we've already discovered, these file naming conventions help us organize, access, process, and analyze our data. So here's some general tips on creating file naming conventions that are both logical and functional. Here are some quick file naming do's. Work out your conventions early to avoid having to spend time redoing it later. Align your file naming with your team and make sure your file names are meaningful with references to the project name, creation date, revision version, or any other useful information needed to understand what's in that file. Now there's some other simple things you can do to make sure your file naming conventions are on point. First of all, you want to keep your file name short and sweet. They're supposed to be quick reference points that tell you what's in a file. From earlier videos, we know that we want to include dates and revision numbers in our file names. I recommend formatting it by year, month, and day because that follows the international date standard. Different countries have different date conventions, so keep that in mind. And when you include revision numbers in a file name, lead with a zero so that if you run into double digits of revisions, it's already built into your conventions. And another good rule is to use hyphens, underscores, or capitalized letters instead of using spaces. Spaces and special characters might not be recognized by your software. Plus, avoiding spaces definitely makes it easier to work in SQL. And my last bit of advice, create a text file that lays out all your naming conventions on a project. This is really helpful if someone new joins your team or if you just need a quick reminder while you're working on something. We talked about this earlier when we covered metadata, which is data about data. It helps explain what data there is and how it's being organized. When you use consistent, meaningful file naming conventions throughout your project, your data will be easy to find and use, and you can save yourself time too. Up next, we'll keep looking at spreadsheets, and we'll talk about security features and how you can use them to protect your data now that it's organized. See you there. OK, now that our data is organized and easy to find, it's time to start thinking about how to protect it. The good news is that spreadsheets come with security features already built in. In this video, we'll look at different spreadsheet programs and how their security features, like sheet protections and access control, are similar. When I say security features, you might be imagining ways to protect data from other people. But that's just one kind of security. Security features can be designed to keep unauthorized users from viewing certain files or just lock your worksheets so that you don't accidentally break your formulas. This is called data security. Data security means protecting data from unauthorized access or corruption by adopting safety measures. Whatever spreadsheet program you're using will have similar security measures built in. As a data analyst, you'll run into Google Sheets and Excel a lot. So let's talk about what they have in common. First, both programs have features that let you protect your spreadsheets or parts of your spreadsheets from being edited. From the entire worksheet down to single cells in a table, so if you're collaborating with other users, you can easily lock down your formulas so that they aren't accidentally broken. Speaking of collaborating, Excel and Google Sheets both have access control features like password protection and user permissions. This gives you more control over who can do what to your spreadsheet. Because these programs are located in different places, these features are slightly different. For Excel spreadsheets, you can encrypt files and worksheets with passwords before emailing them to other users. In Google Sheets, these settings are found under the Sharing menu, which allows you to control who can see or edit the sheet online. Google Sheets can also be copied so that users can work with that data without altering the original. Tabs can also be hidden and unhidden in Sheets and Excel, allowing you to change what data is being viewed. But remember, even hidden tabs can be unhidden by someone else, so be sure you're okay with those tabs still being accessible. As a data analyst, data security will be a priority. But no matter which program you use to create spreadsheets, there are security features to help you keep your work safe and secure. Congratulations on finishing this video from the Google Data Analytics Certificate. Access the full experience, including job search help, and start to earn the official certificate by clicking the icon or the link in the description. Watch the next video in the course by clicking here. And subscribe to our channel for more from upcoming Google Career Certificates.